afternoon everyone uh, welcome yeah so today's session being on chronic pain and addiction uh, so this the, the title of the presentation was supposed to be chronic pain but uh, the entire entity of chronic pain is actually uh, a little too vast for uh, i think even uh, an entire day lecture and uh, chronic pain and addiction itself forms an entire new subject so i have tried to uh, compile most of whatever i have uh, read into a concise uh presentation i hope i'm able to convey what i have uh, read so um i the outline of the presentation being definitions the epidemiology the pathophysiology chronic pain and addiction guidelines for the management of chronic pain management of concurrent diagnosis that is addiction as well as chronic pain together and a summary of the same uh so definitions pain as such has been defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage what is chronic pain so chronic pain pain without any apparent biological value uh, now this pain in pain in itself serves as a protective mechanism so we have pain we try and avert whatever that is causing the pain or remove the stimulus that is causing it but chronic pain does not have any biological value it is persisted beyond the normal tissue healing time as determined by common medical experience or is also defined as a persistent pain that is not amenable as a rule to treatments based upon specific remedies so uh, there have been issues with regard to actual definitions of chronic pain some say pain over a period of one month uh, as as part of some consensus chronic non malignant pain is typically defined as pain that persists for longer than 6 months so coming to the epidemiology there have been um, there has been one study in 2014 which has been done in india uh, which has worked on the similar principles what uh, brevik et al did in 2006 so this was a study which was carried out in europe in multiple countries they had uh, sent out telephonic surveys and had multiple uh, sessions with patients who had chronic pain out of 46394 people 19% of that population had chronic pain on similar lines you need to look at uh, the pain the, the most common site of pain was that of uh, knee pain that is osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis similarly in india as i mentioned in 2014 about 13% of the population was noted to have chronic pain uh they have used the same scales as that they have used in the 2006 study right so um as why are we talking about this is because chronic pain can affect uh, a person's daily life in terms of walking in terms of being able to do household chores in terms of being able to drive work outside home basically carry out adequate normal functioning so uh, there are some social demographic factors which may contribute to this one is being female gender and older age a uh, lower socio economic status employment status and occupational factors in addition to history of abuse and interpersonal violence so coming to the pathophysiology so i'm sure all of you are aware of the physiology of normal pain so so pain is basically transmitted through a delta and c fibers um uh, go up right there dorsal root ganglion then through the uh, spinothalamic tract the anterior spinothalamic tract so there are two relays essentially which happens one is directly to the sensory cortex so you call this sensory discriminative pathway and the other is the affective motivational pathway so so basically there is an affective response to pain as well so one i can see and tell you where the pain is the second is i actually feel what the pain is so there are two components to that in itself in addition you have a descending tract wherein the opioidergic pathway basically mitigates the painful stimulus which is where our opioid uh, drugs come into play mm-hmm. so coming to the topic at hand that is chronic pain and addiction so if you look at data from everywhere chronic pain addiction as well as psychiatric comorbidities coexist um it is very difficult to delineate uh, some of these in a lot of patients and even if we do delineate them managing them is a an issue so couple of terminologies that we'd like to discuss first hand one is addiction so addiction is a primary chronic neurobiologic disease with genetic psychosocial and environmental factors influencing its development and manifestation it is characterized by behaviors that include one or more of the following what are those so that is impaired control over drug use a compulsive use continued use despite harm and craving now why are we talking about this it is primarily because a lot of patients with chronic pain are prescribed opioids now if they are prescribed opioid drugs now we have to distinguish whether they actually have substance dependence or is it a function of something else hence the definitions 
So physical dependence is a state of adaptation that is manifested by a drug class specific withdrawal syndrome that can be produced by abrupt cessation, rapid role, dose reduction, decreasing blood level of the drug and or administration of an antagonist. What is pseudo addiction? So pseudo addiction is, is uh, a term which describes patient behaviors that occur when pain is inadequately treated, including clock watching and drug seeking. So basically someone being treated for pain and the pain is actually not treated adequately. And he's receiving the adequate medication, but then he's still continuing to complain of pain. So this patient will go on to seek drugs. Uh, this patient will keep asking the nurses for more medication. So this is this this is all constituted under the gamut of pseudo addiction. So uh, in the DSM-5 category, I mean diagnostic category, they've clearly made a mention that one tolerance is not counted for those taking medications under medical supervision, such as anal analgesics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, or beta blockers. The same for withdrawal symptoms. So coming to the next, uh, uh, the next, um, well, one of the problems that people face with uh, patients who are on opioid medications or drugs for chronic pain, which is aberrant behavior. So it is basically behavior that suggests prescription misuse, abuse or addiction. So prescribing opioids will almost always, I mean, will, will lead to abuse or addiction in a small percentage of chronic pain patients but a large percentage will demonstrate aberrant drug related behaviors and illicit drug use. So these percentages appear to be much less. So if the chronic pain patients are pre-selected for the absence of a current or past history of alcohol, drug use or abuse or addiction. So what this clearly states is that uh, before we go on to prescribe opioid or, or dependence producing substances for patients, we need to evaluate them in detail to try and see if we can prevent them from actually depend becoming dependent or having such aberrant drug related behaviors. So what are these behaviors that we look for in a patient? So uh, before that, we'll come to the prevalence of addiction in chronic pain patients. So uh, about 24 studies with 2057 patients with a rate of 3.27% for abuse or addiction. And the rate of abuse or addiction in patients with no history or current use of substances was 0.19%, which is actually quite low when you look at the number of patients who have been prescribed opioids. So coming to the spectrum of aberrant behaviors, so you classify them being mild, moderate or severe. So mild would be when the patient comes and requests for higher doses. He requests for specific drugs. Then he says, I probably lost the prescription. He says, I want an occasional increase in drug without permission and occasional early refills. So this is about the mild. So when you come into moderate use of treatment to treat the symptom other than pain. So I'm coming to you for pain treatment Then I say I have another symptom. So give me more opiates. Stockpiling treatment in the time of reduced symptom, significant energy spent assuring supply, multiple unsanctioned dose escalations, recurrent prescription losses or early refills, decline in function from baseline, concurrent use of illicit substances. So very simply, it's just an exaggeration of what the mild is plus addition of other drugs or illicit substances to achieve whatever symptom benefits the patient wants. The spectrum of aberrant behavior severe is continual escalation of the dose, seeking treatment from other providers, multiple providers, stealing drugs, consistently buying treatment off the street, selling drugs, uh, forging prescriptions, and uh, injecting oral drugs that have been prescribed. So it is very important that we identify these patients beforehand to try and prevent this from happening. Or once this has started occurring, we need to take preventive or uh, preemptive measures to prevent this from happening again or stop it. So how do we manage this? So do we start, do we stop prescribing? Do we ask the patient to walk away? Well, so, so basically we need to medicalize it and not stigmatize the non adherence as with any other disease such as diabetes. So ask and try to empathically understand the reasons for the behavior. Be open and non-judgmental regarding the explanation, even if you don't believe. Right? So this is very important. So you, you want the patient to come back to you. You want him to get out of this aberrant drug use behavior and you want to continue treatment for him. So when do we start tapering opioids? So we taper opioids here, moderate to severe aberrant behavior, as mentioned earlier, that continues despite repeated warnings and implementation of more close monitoring. So you can also go on to do a long taper and begin an alternative pharmacological or non-pharmacological treatment for the pain. Do not abandon the patient even if you refer. So when do you stop opioids? So 
they continue to exhibit aberrant behaviors in the severe category and represent a danger to the patient and public danger such that we not allow humane tapering injection of oral medication selling prescription forging stealing overdoses all right so when you need to discontinue the opioid medication you do a slow taper uh, decrease by about 10% of the original dose and when 20% of original dose remains decrease by 5% every one to two weeks right so um prior to all this so so now we've covered the concept of addiction we've co covered tolerance we've co covered pseudo addiction we've covered aberrant drug drug seeking behaviors the ab ab aberrant drug related behaviors so now uh, coming down to when a patient comes to you for treatment for chronic pain there are certain guidelines which have been put down for management of the same what i mean by management of the same is prescription of chronic uh, long term opioid therapy for a patient who comes to you with chronic pain so it's very important first to select the type of patient and do a risk stratification right so now we're looking at a preventive measure to prevent dependence then it's important to have an informed consent and opioid management plans uh, the initiation and titration of opioids must be under close surveillance monitoring of the same is very important and high risk patients which i will come which i will come to and discuss need to be monitored much closely than before Dose escalations and high dose opioid therapy, opioid rotations, indications for discontinuation need to be discussed with the patient. Also, when a patient is on opioid uh, therapy, uh, there, I mean, uh, there need to be some guidelines in terms of them being allowed to drive, uh, conditions for breakthrough breakthrough pain in uh, pregnancy and opioid policies. So, Chau et al has given uh, clear guidelines in terms of how to prescribe these opioids, when to prescribe them, what needs to be advised while doing the same. so how do we assess the pain so now uh, as all of you may know we have, you have the visual analog scale then you have the numerical rating scale so primarily you just show the patient and ask him to tell you what he feels at this point and you grade the pain regarding the i mean uh, according to what the patient says now this is the most commonly used and it gives you a picture of the current intensity of the pain and it is very useful in acute pain as the same follow in chronic pain well chronic pain differs because the causes for chronic pain are 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 plenty and not every person with chronic pain will have the same etiology so chronic pain in itself covers a gamut of patients who have cancer patients who have uh, neuropathic pain patients who have lower back pain patients who have orofacial pain so all of these are covered under the large gamut of chronic pain so our duty as uh doctors and medical professionals is to try and establish what the cause of the pain is right before we start him on opioid treatment so first we need to get a detail of the pain history so pain history would involve when did the pain start where is the pain what happens to the pain what are the aggravating relieving factors of the pain has he tried any medication earlier with the same subsequent to which you will do a physical examination and then you have specific diagnostic tests for the same right so the assessment tools that uh, have been put forth are the brief pain inventory the megill pain questionnaire the massachusetts general hospital pain centers pain assessment form the initiative on methods measurement and pain assessment in clinical trials so the imm pa uh, ct actually covers uh, aspects of pain physical functioning emotional functioning patient ratings of improvement and satisfaction with treatment other symptoms and adverse events during treatment patient's disposition and characteristics right so after all of this we just discussed opioids and chronic pain now i i i'm uh, this slide comes up here primarily because all of the other slides were related to the aberrant uh, drug related behaviors and coming up to here now so who is given opioids which patient do i choose and say okay i'm going to give this patient opioids so if there is a patient with chronic non cancer pain a patient with moderate or severe intensity of the pain is one who will get opioids the pain is having an adverse impact on the function or the quality of life of the patient also the potential therapeutic benefits outweigh or are likely to outweigh the potential harms so these are three things that we need to actually see so if someone comes to you with mild chronic pain he will not get opioids someone comes to you with moderate or severe pain is only when you will prescribe opioids so how do we classify risk so you have low risk moderate risk and high risk now what risk are we talking about this is the risk of the patient progressing to having aberrant drug related behaviors or developing addiction right 
So who is low risk? So low risk is someone who comes to you with no personal or family history of substance use disorder, no or minimal concomitant psychopathology. Right. So there should be no family history, no personal history, and minimal psychopathology. Moderate risk are those with a past history of substance use, a strong family history, past or current psychiatric history. Right. So past history of substance use, strong family history, past or current psychiatric history. And high risk are actively addicted or unstable and major psychiatric comorbidities. Right. So you have the low, the moderate, and the high risk. So the risk factors for dependence are also dependent on genetic predisposition, psychiatric comorbidities, poor social support, history of pre-adolescent sexual abuse, nicotine dependence. Right. So depending on the risk uh, that the patient has, you will stratify him. In, I mean, you will put him into one of these categories. And so, so low risk patients can be given in primary healthcare settings or settings at, at, at a general physician. Moderate or high risk will have to be. Treated with opioids in liaison with a pain management specialist, as well as a, as well as a psychiatrist together. So these are this is basically data from the Western culture where they have uh, clear cut delineation between these particular uh, branches. So how do we assess risk? So coming to all of this, so we have the low, the moderate, and the high risk. How do we assess them? So we have four things that we need to keep doing at at, at various periods of time during. Uh, while we are seeing patients. So you have screening tools, uh, you have the urine drug screen, you have the mental health screening and you have monitoring of the same. So uh, screening screening tools, there are close to about 25 screening tools which are 25, 25 and more screening tools which have been used for evaluation of the risk of opioid, I mean risk of dependence. Now these have been primarily studied in um, uh, retro, I mean, these have been primarily retrospective scales which have been devised in patient populations. So none of these have actually been tested on prospective studies or none of them have actual validity in real life, but then some have clinical utility of which you have the opioid risk tool, you have the Alcuri screening tool, uh, details of which are available online. So prior to seeing a patient, we need to apply these particular scales so we can establish what risk the patient may have in developing dependence. In addition, so during the initiation and maintenance of therapy, routine drug testing is a must. So uh, also studies have noted that random drug screenings are more beneficial than planned ones. So the aims of drug testing are basically ensuring compliance and uh, trying to see if there are there is any illicit opioid usage. Uh, mental health screening. So this is primarily to ensure that underlying psychiatric illnesses are treated owing to the high level of comorbidity. So now the mental health screening is not a one-time thing that happens. It has to occur at various periods of time because there's a chance that people can develop access one disorders during treatment with uh, opioids or else. So after the patient has been prescribed, there is, uh, like, like I mentioned, a stratification based on risk. So you need to monitor. So monitoring for low risk would mean less frequent monitoring. Moderate to high risk would mean more frequent monitoring, more frequent urine drug screens aberrant drug related behavior check. So these can be again, as mentioned, there you, you need to look at the number of prescriptions that the patient has lost Has he come to you frequently for more drug fills and uh, physical examinations regularly. So universal precaution, this is something we've we've uh, learned in terms of uh, HIV, but then uh, universal precaution in terms of prescribing opioids for chronic pain is Again, these are steps that every person needs to follow before we start prescribing. So one is a formulation of diagnosis with differentials. So this is primarily to look at conditions which can be treated without opioids, conditions that can be treated with other medications. Then a psychological assessment, including the risk of addictive disorder and informed consent. So this is very important before initiating opioid therapy, telling the patient about the harms, the benefits and uh, the need for frequent follow ups and routine checks. A treatment agreement for the same, pre and post intervention assessment of pain level and function, then a trial of opioid therapy or adjunctive medication. In addition, there needs to be a routine reassessment of pain score and function, regular assessment of the four A's, which is the analgesia, the activity levels, adverse effects, and aberrant behaviors. There also needs to be a periodic review of the pain diagnosis and development of comorbid conditions, including addictive disorders. Uh, a very key aspect of this is documentation. So uh, coming down to the management of concurrent diagnosis. So 
as mentioned earlier, rates of opioid abuse in those treated for pain are actually low in the subset of patients with no psychiatric comorbidities and the low risk of abuse. Patients with both chronic pain and opioid abuse have significant comorbidities impairing treatment outcomes. So, patients, uh, these patients have been noted to have a greater incidence of psychiatric diagnosis, repeated complaints of inadequately treated pain, and more health problems, which actually has been translated to note that patients have higher rates of suicide, depression, and anxiety as well. So, this is the modified or the new adaptation of the analgesic ladder. This is not by the WHO, but this is a modification of the same by Varga Schaffer, which has gone on to include chronic non cancer or non malignant pain as well in the steps. So, uh, the step one, as everyone knows, is usage of non opioid analgesics. Step two is the weak opioids. Step three is stronger opioids being methadone, oral administration or a transdermal patch. And step four being nerve block, epidurals. Uh, a patient controlled uh, pump, uh, neurolytic block therapy and spinal stimulators. So what this basically tells you is that there is a graded pattern in which we can actually prescribe medication. However, after going through literature, there are no clear cut guidelines on how to start or what the stratification in terms of uh, opioid treatment is. So people are free to choose what opioids they are going to prescribe. They initially start with uh, shorter acting opioids and longer acting if pain is inadequately controlled. So this is uh, pharmacokinetic data for oral opioids, uh, available codeine, morphine, um, so pharmacotherapy for chronic pain um, and opioid abuse together. The treatment modalities that are available as mentioned earlier were methadone, uh, buprenorphine, non-opioid medi medications, uh, cannabis and ketamine. So, and as well as non-pharmacological methods, so cognitive and operant behavior therapy, 12-step program, complementary and alternative medicine. Now, methadone is a full new opioid agonist, blocks the NMDA, aspartate and monoamine reuptake. Long-acting development of tolerance is low, which potentially leads to a lower long-term dosing, half-life about 15 to 60 hours. Methadone uh, also has been noted to have efficacy because of the NMDA receptor blocking it. Some amount of caution because methadone in itself is potent, the risk of respiratory depression and QT prolongation. Uh, buprenorphine though, which is now currently available in a few centers, uh, it's a partial mu agonist and has antagonistic effects at the kappa opioid receptor. Uh, there have been a couple of studies which have looked at uh, buprenorphine in terms of pain management and they've included buprenorphine in the pain gui guidelines as well. Uh, this is noted to have a greater safety profile as compared to a pure mu agonist. So side effects of opioids being uh, constipation, sedation, nausea, vomiting, decreased libido, pleuritis, and myoclonus. So even during chronic opioid therapy, it is important to look for these particular side effects. So we know how to manage them and uh, take the adequate call when required. Now, non-opioid medications. So the place of non-opioid medications here, uh, there, are a, uh, there are a large number of conditions which actually respond to non-opioid medications, primarily pleuritic pains fibromyalgia, chronic low backache, and uh, TCAs, SNRIs, pregabalin, baclofen, and NSAIDs have been proven to work in fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain, rather TCAs, SNRIs, and neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia. Uh, nociceptive and inflammatory pain responds to NSAIDs. So when we have a patient who, who, who is actually in the milder category and there is evidence for use of tricyclic antidepressants or SNRIs, we would rather prefer that prior to starting the patient on opioids. Uh, cannabis and ketamine, so, so both of these drugs have shown efficacy in treating pain syndromes. There is a lack of data, however, to support use in chronic pain. It has been shown to have efficacy in central and peripheral neuropathic states and ketamine in uh, pain states, which carries a risk of abuse potential as well. Right. So the other non-pharmacological methods, CBT and uh, operant behavior therapy, have shown results in pain patients with fibromyalgia. So here it's primarily uh, asking the patient to defocus from the pain, try and uh, get the patient to look at other aspects of uh, treatment in terms when when we reach adequate levels of medication is when we can actually resort to using non-pharmacological or can be used concurrently. Uh, it has been noted to have an I mean noted to be an effective intervention for lower back pain. Um, yeah, so 
uh, a summary of the, the presentation. So, so chronic pain is primarily a complex entity with a significant morbidity, usually defined as pain that persists for more than six months, includes multiple conditions, the prevalence of which is about 12 to 13, 12 to 30 percent, and about 13 percent in the Indian population. Concepts of pseudo addiction, aberrant uh, drug related behaviors. Uh, chronic pain needs detailed evaluation, including type of pain, the intensity, duration, emotional functioning, treatment history, and uh, specific to opioid treatment, risk stratification based on personal, past, and family history, a need for constant monitoring, including urine drug screens, mental health evaluations, physical examinations, and uh, treatment includes using opioids with caution, short acting as well as long acting. The role of non-pharmacological modes of intervention play an important role. Um, Dr. Daniel, do we for a proportion of slides uh, used in this? Add something. Can I can I add something? Oh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, what I was saying, I was uh, I like to put that in internal medicine there is a critical care unit or critical care medicine. Similarly, I think when you are handling this type of cases, we also need a critical care unit. The patient might have an acute respiratory depression or there may be torsed deep pointies, or patient may have a cardiac complications or severe electrolyte imbalance. I think in this context, critical care psychiatry uh, uh, has to be amplified, emphasized in particular these subgroup of patients. Absolutely. Sir. I think um, one of the issues uh, with opioids is also about concurrent use of benzodiazepines and other uh, painkillers. Often the focus is so much on opioids that actually it's the other medications which also can contribute to so many complications. But I think uh, before uh, starting uh, opioid treatment, uh, a good uh, chronic pain assessment is very, very essential because even before we consider opioids, because let's say that somebody has already has coma with depression, the intensity of pain is likely to go up. So they are more people who are depressed and anxious are likely to report more severe uh, forms of pain. So let's say that if you take just the intensity of pain, you're more likely to prescribe opioids. But I think it's important to first understand the, the comorbid conditions which could actually influence the pain behaviors as well as uh, the intensity of pain. So if that is the case, then probably you could just treat the depression, probably the pain symptoms will also come down. So asked, uh, are there any tools to assess pain standardized for the Indian um, Actually, the, there are two forms of brief pain inventory. Both have been used in Indian settings and they are available in almost Hindi, Kannada, Malayalam, I think a couple of Indian languages. So you can use the short form brief pain inventory. That's a good tool. Uh, however, Again, uh, what uh, he was discussing in terms of whether they're really suitable for chronic pain is a question because the brief pain inventory says that in the last 24 hours, in the last one week, how has been your pain and how much has it caused interference? So, but these are used in Indian settings, but there is a, uh, right now, I think uh, one group actually is developing a tool for assessment of chronic pain. So we probably have to have, um, one for uh, the first assessment and then oh, subsequently for follow-up probably we need uh, different kinds of assessment but BPA is the one which is there. In the risk assessment you mentioned one of the component is the family history of substance abuse use disorder. Uh, is it only opiate substance use or even nicotine? Any, any, any substance use, ma'am. Uh, actually, most of these... Nicotine will be there in almost every family. Absolutely, ma'am. So, so it's it's any type of substance use which carries the risk of them developing substance dependence on the opioids which have been prescribed. What a majority of these studies which have used these scales have actually found is that patients who have a past history of nicotine dependence, especially cigarettes, has had a good predictive value of them actually developing dependence with opioids. So I think that's another factor that we need to keep in mind when we are assessing these patients, whether they're actually dependent on cigarettes or not. Because that's come across a, a lot of these scales which have uh, been put into use. I think the opioid risk assessment tool actually is based on the risk factors for developing uh, addiction. So and this uh, risk factors are based actually on a large cohort uh, of group of uh, patients who had chronic pain. So in that sense, probably, uh, maybe I think we might get uh, different risk factors in Indian setting, we do. 
if I can ask you, are you getting a lot of people with, let's say, trauma or addiction? The reason I'm telling, yesterday we had a death of a gentleman who, who actually took huge amount of spasoproxone plus, you know, a person, middle aged person, and he was taking, actually, seeing spasoproxone plan. As you know, uh, spasoproxone plan has been banned in India. Same company come with Paranormal Plus, which is a Tramadol Plus. This, this gentleman took 40 tablets and before he actually came to, uh, came to the OPD and before we could resuscitate, he, we lost him. Uh, the, the point is that these are you know, prescribed drugs, but also very potent drugs. Uh, I was wondering whether, uh, do you see similar cases in your settings? Who come with the Tramadol or uh, uh, basically painkiller reduce? Do you see patients in your practice? Tramadol abuse has been very common because in the periphery, in every village, doctor, everybody else, whatever is the cause of the pain, first thing is they give Tramadol. And then they do advise them to go to a higher center to find out to, you know what is the level of cancer, whether secondary are developed or whatever it is. But they can't afford because the pain subsides. Then they go back home. Again, they come back to the same doctor and get a tramadol and go back. They never reach to a center or anything like that. And ultimately, they come and reach me for tramadol de addiction. And that is a very common thing. I really don't know what to talk to the primary health center doctor because he says, see, I have advised them to go. They are not going because the pain has subsided. They go back. They come back again in acute pain. I, I don't think they can reach Bangalore. So I do give tramadol. So this is the commonest reply from the primary health center doctors or whoever is in the villages. I think I think we'll agree completely with Madam. I think the, at least uh, even the people are not vulnerable predictions. Uh, you know, let's see. I have, we have three cases uh, of female women. Who are in general, there are some families, but they are other middle layers, they are not somebody who is very prone to get addiction. Because here, property of trauma was being opioid, and they took so and they slowly, you know, all three have got parental trauma and oral trauma addictions. I mean, the uh, limit was so high, so this is the problem. So, do you? Some the people who have the uh, nicotine addiction, tobacco chewing addiction, and that is the cancer related to that. And they have been stopped of the tobacco and they got down to tramadol. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, I think uh, treatment, pain relief uh, should also be adequate despite, uh, you know, the risk of addiction. It's never, it's about 18, even uh, chronic pain population, the risk of addiction is about 15 to 18%. So, but there's a large proportion who really need care. Uh, if we probably, let's say, at, prob at all levels, primary care level, even assessing uh, simple risk assessment tools, will again, in the, or let's say that they have one or two moderate risk or high risk, if we can identify, okay, these are the patients who are uh, at risk, then we can actually monitor, maybe give them a prescription for just for two days or three days and asking them to come back, uh, you know, for a fo quick follow-up. Um, but I think uh, we need to take a very balanced approach because the, what you mentioned about uh, chronic pain prevalence is a point prevalence is about 13%. So we don't know about lifetime prevalence and uh, the disability is quite high. So probably I think we really need to think before we... Somebody in Sorob is asking that how to deal with medication overuse headache if you look this is a chronic pain. Abuse or overuse, or don't tell me what you <laughs> But I think, uh, Sarab, you need to probably uh, you know, look at. Uh, One, stop uh, all the medications. If you have a facility for inpatient, I think that is there's nothing like that. Make sure that list of number of medications. Often we uh, miss out on the over the counter medications and lots of them get ultra set over the counter so i think uh, that gets missed when we take the history because patients may not even know the name of the painkiller so one uh, one of the thing that uh, strategy that they mention is if inpatient care stop all the medications and then uh, give a drug free a period for at least two weeks before uh, there's actually medication overuse headache is predominantly uh, discussed with migraine where uh, you know, patients who are on multiple uh, migraine medications can. 
develop this. Yeah, I think Sourav is mentioning the same thing. Is in patients abusing NSAID and ergotamines in this clinical trial. Those are the group of probably we are talking about migraine for the people who uses a lot of expenses. How big? How big is the set risk of such medication? And the question here is uh, one of my colleagues from Bihar. At the primary health center level, how to handle the overuse or abuse populations? Okay. Um, I, I think at first is primarily as mentioned is a clear evaluation of the pain. I think prior to actually giving someone a prescription, I think it's very important us, for us to find out what is causing the pain, be it chronic pain or whatever it is. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of conditions which are treated without opioids itself. Determining severity of the pain also is something that we can do at the PHC level, which is with a visual analog scale, you can actually determine the severity of the pain. And uh, I think prescribing non-opioid medication would be the first step to actually try and see if elevation occurs. And if that doesn't happen, then I think move on to as the, the, the pain ladder would suggest. And again, assess pain at all intervals. I, that's, yeah, I mean, I think uh, best way to screen is just few questions about, you know, do they use any other, including alcohol, because we have some data from the center where patients who were, uh, yeah, I think, diagnosed with alcohol dependence in about 18 to 20 percent had uh, chronic pain. And they were also using uh, alcohol as a way to elevate the pain. So if you can just ask questions related to have they been using any other substances? Anybody in the family who has these substances? Any other mental health problems? You can screen them for depression, anxiety. So you know that this person has these conditions, so he's more likely to abuse uh, opioids. So one option is, first question we can ask ourselves is, are opioids really indicated in this condition? See, one of the things, I mean, some of the case reports are very interesting. People who actually want uh, opioid prescription, they're more likely to come in when you're, you know, about to leave the clinic or, you know, so that you're, we've seen that it happens even with benzodiazepines. They just don't, you know, they're not really willing to listen. They are in a hurry and then they know that you're also in a hurry to leave. So I think it's just about, I think all these questions will take about five minutes. I not we can set this opioid assessment uh, tools. tools. Yes, yes. So I think what will the next uh, when you will get the next invitation, we'll send the opioid risk assessment tools with all of you, and you can keep a copy and you know use in your, yes, your yes. very small one and uh, help with all of us. Hypoca it's a very uh, because there is a postmenopausal. A lot of women do report of uh, pains, multiple pains. There's no data to suggest that this is actually linked to hypocalcemia. They, they have not really looked at, you know, the calcium levels and then uh, corroborated with the pain reports. So I'm not sure whether it's actually, you know, whether calcium supplements alone will elevate the pain. But now it has become a fashion, especially in orthopedics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they use calcium 60, supplements. 60,000 international units weekly. Are we justified to put cannabis and ketamine also as one of the treatment things at this stage? <laughs> in the treatment mode, cannabis and ketamine, we have already put it and we have spread it at this stage. Yeah, we don't increase our work, ma'am. We have enough work. See, I think I personally, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, see, I was looking at a report in NMJ recently, which is compared two states, I mean, as you know, in Colorado state, cannabis has been legalized. So this study has looked at people who stay in Colorado versus people who come from neighboring countries, states to Colorado to use the pericrescent use of cannabis. Who has more emergency admissions? So they found people who actually come from outside and use Colorado, come to Colorado to use cannabis is more emergency admission than the population of Colorado where it's been available, like legalized. So I think um, it may be right to do it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult to answer. But yeah, ketamine has be, is being used actually in Kidwai pain management clinic. Cancer pain, it's regularly ketamine is being used. Sir, I have a case. Mm -hmm. uh, a female, uh, 60 years old, mm -hmm. has unilateral left side headache mm -hmm. since last 32, 32 years. Mm -hmm. And particularly in the uh, sleeping stage, mm -hmm. when she goes to bed, she uh, feel more pain than 
everything stays. Uh, she, uh, she has all type of tests, images, and nothing could have been detected. And every time she was on analgesic and other tramadol and other, she get relief, but uh, not yet completely. She all time wants some painkiller for her headache. Whether it is a pseudo addiction or a real it is a case of depression. Pathological case. Antidepressant she has got. No, all type of calciums, all type, mm -hmm. all the placebo treatments she has been given. So basically, I mean, what, what probably will be the best policy is good assessment, keeping as you're telling mm -hmm. women, 60 year old, assessment of the little, obviously physical and also psychological factors, environmental factors, to at least lead you until the time you can decrease or stop most of the medicines. Because these medicines are, well, most of them, uh, the medicines will obviously distort the whole symptoms. So in, in it makes a good uh, setting where drug free evaluation will at least lead you what is going to work or not going to work. See one, she need one or two tablets and almost yes. daily for yes. 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 She gets better. Whether it may be plus more. So in our area, when all the drugs fail, cortisone works. <laughs> no, I mean, I think uh, one uh, one of the important uh, aspect is she reports of headache just before going to sleep. So probably that is the time she pays attention to her uh, bodily symptom. So that's an indication that we need a probably a good uh, psychological assessment. What is her explanatory model for her uh, pain? Who does she think is the cause of her headache? Yeah. Basically, she for true. the last 20 years, the patient is with you. Okay. So sometimes you know symptoms again and again also like uh, all of us is a headache for the person and for us also. Okay. Uh, I think that's yes. Yeah. Uh, let, let's uh, let's get call it. Are there anybody who is addicted to topical analgesics? Most of the ointment, painkiller ointments and sprays and other things. They use quite often, quite a lot of old ladies who are uh, with chronic low back and other things they do use but are there addiction no, I don't really I, I know that because most of these ladies you know they just want a refill very urgently though there is a little bit of ointment is left and the spray they are very much worried when, when it get exhausted and they keep on asking and uh, you know the whole salience is so high <laughs> <laughs> Whoever enters first thing, uh, did you bring the ointment or this one? Is is it a kind of addiction? Um, I, <laughs> I'm not sure, but I know that a lot of people use the bombs uh, very often. Whether it qualifies, I don't think there's any criteria for to call them as addiction. But I know women who have developed skin reactions because of excessive use of uh, these uh, local applications leading to itching, changes in the skin texture. So in that sense, I'm not sure. Say in terms of the definition of addiction, it would not qualify. So. Okay, I think uh, let's call it a day today, ma'am. So, to all of you, I think thanks a lot, all of you.